are using college students. That's really cool. Who else? Does anybody use Google Analytics for any of their stuff they're doing, websites? Yes? They just released a new interface where they actually feature the people who use analytics and how they use them, and they, that's their homepage of their story. So it's not a stock person. So this is actually where I went um, with my career starting out saying, I want to take photos. And this is my current site now. It's not what it looked like back then. But so I've been doing this for years and years, but just taking photos. Um, I got my first camera when I was probably like eight. Um, and I used to make my siblings stand and do the, the you know, trick photos, the little, you know, this kind of stuff. And so this got me to the point that I was like, you know what, I really like helping companies market. So that's when I started taking more classes and getting into uh, the marketing side of things, which then meant, which then led me to what I do today. So I, I worked for a marketing agency, um, and I still contract with them. I actually just left um, that position a couple weeks ago. This is one of the most recent clients we had, but marketing is supposed to solve problems. And Deb wanted me to talk about what kind of problems do I solve. So what happens when someone comes to you and says, I have a new business, I'm gonna market it. What's the first question you typically ask them? <coughs> Who's your customer? Who's your target customer? So if I know my target customer, how is that going to help me design a website? Probably feature them. If I want to feature them. What does communication have to do with marketing? You can talk at the person that's actually buying your business. So you have a brain voice. The way you want to be heard. What about support? What about customer service? If you have someone or some company that you're working with that you want to know an answer to something, how do you typically try to get a hold of them? Especially now, like this group. How do you do? Do you call them? Do you text them? Do you email them? What do you do? Text them? What if the company doesn't have a text number? Call. Call. Would you call before you email? If your hands raised, who would call? Who would email? Why would you need to call an email in the first place? Do you have a question? So the number one thing you can do with your startup is how are you going to think for the people that are having the questions before they even call about the question? So what types of questions are coming through? If you have a business like this is this is for Berry Farm, if they already have a lot of questions that are coming through, how can you make sure people find that information? So for instance, they had a lot of people that kept saying like, hey, what are your hours? On their other website, they didn't have a link that said hours. Seems really simple, right? But to someone who just, they're so worried about running the business and getting people in and getting the things done, that the thing about hours just didn't, didn't cross their mind. The other thing they had was admission. How much does it cost to get in? So you'd have people running through this contact form and they get all these emails every day about how much does it cost? Can I bring my dog? Is my dog extra? Can I bring my three-year-old? Is it okay if she's two but her birthday's next week? Is that still okay? <laughs> that can all be taken care of right here and in your marketing so that you can spend time actually communicating your value with customers rather than solving problems that probably should have been solved before you even started. So as you're building your startup, one of the things, um, is anybody at Startup Weekend, Lincoln? A couple weekends ago? Okay, um, I participated in Startup Weekend a couple weekends ago and um, the idea that, that I was running with was a software for health and fitness facilities to manage their fitness instructors. And um, so we pitched that, built it all weekend, and actually we won on Sunday night. But the thing that made that relevant was I work in that industry, and I have for several years because I like to be active, and I got certified as a personal trainer. To manage the schedules of me teaching classes with 60 other part-time people was a pain in my butt, and it still is. And so how can this software solve? It wasn't a solving any sort of revenue model. It wasn't advertising. It was pure communication. So think about that in your startup. How can communication play a major role? Because some companies, what I'm finding out in my case studies with clients is follow-up and execution are putting them above competitors. Their product's the same, their service is the same, their people are the same, but they return emails within 24 hours, or they return phone calls in two hours. So think about that, because college students, it's really fun during the week, and then on the weekend, maybe if you're building a business, oh, I won't answer my email on Saturday. If you're building a business and you're in college, people still expect you to function like a business. So, Make some mandates for yourself and think about what that looks like. All right, anybody seen something like this? Marketing, look familiar. So this is basically the, the wheel model or the hub model, because in the middle is your website. So the thing that I didn't, I shouldn't say I didn't know, when I was in college we still had websites, but your website was not the center of your universe. 
obviously it grew to be, but when, when I started college, the things that um, existed when I graduated college, we didn't learn when we were freshmen. We didn't learn when we were sophomores. And the same is going to be true of you. In two years, there's going to be software that you didn't use now. But with your website being the mothership, everything has to go back there. How do you track it? Which means as a startup, if you have a website, get yourself some Google Analytics so you can track where people are going, what they're clicking on, where they're coming from. There's a lot of different technology. The IT department could probably help you a lot with that. What we used to have was just this one. Okay, so when we were in college, we talked about PR. So let's get in the newspaper, let's get in the magazine. Let's talk about direct mail, traditional advertising, being a billboard, sandwich sign, guerrilla marketing. But since we introduced all three of these other ones, as a marketer now, the top thing is, you're required to know about all of these things. But if the really good ones are good at one of these circles or one of these sub-circles. So for instance, podcasts. Who listens to podcasts? Do you mind sharing what podcasts you listen to? Uh, Joe Rogan, Bill Simmons. Is that like a comedy podcast? Yeah, okay. sports. Yes. Oh, yes, sports. So sports podcasts, business podcasts. Um, if you can get guest appearances on business podcasts as a startup, that is a great place for PR for you. But if you're thinking about that and you don't listen to podcasts, you have no idea where to start. You can Google top business podcasts or, for me, top health and fitness podcasts. But you have to listen to the podcast first before you pitch them an idea because they're going to sniff you out and be like, you've never listened to this before. You don't even know what you're talking about. So figure out what, which one of these bubbles here, because when you get to the validation part of your startup, the judges in the competition will probably ask you, how are you going to get customers? And to get customers, you have to have some of these things figured out. And you might as go as far as figuring out how much each one of these things will cost, how many customers you might get, and then what's that cost per customer? Because if your product costs 50 bucks and your cost per customer is $200, you're probably never going to equal out. So figure out which one of these things. We'll come back to this at the end because this is going to be part of our application. But this is one of the things that when I work with clients, they think they just need, like, I had one client that was like, well, we got a really good offer in the newspaper. I haven't gotten the newspaper for about 10 years. <laughs> I freely read it online because they make me pay for it after I view it 10 times. So I get my news from Twitter, and I get my news from CNBC and Facebook. I mean, people know stuff on Facebook before it even hits the news. So, which also leads to misrepresentation of facts, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the, um, the not-so-silent marketing rules, okay? You guys, this one should be a given. Your product and service shall not suck. Like, it really, you can't have a product or service that sucks because what happens is you end up marketing your face off and you do a really good job. You have great-looking ads. You have nice spokespeople, good testimonials, good videos. They use your product, and it's not going to match up to what they think. They tell their friends. They don't use it again. So you have to find new customers. So instead of keeping these current customers satisfied, they say, you know what, don't go back there again. Don't use that. It broke. It did this. So as you're building your startup, you guys are going to have, like, Reed Hoffman, I think it's Hoffman, who launched uh, LinkedIn, said if you're not embarrassed by the first iteration of your product or service, you've launched too late. And that means don't wait for everything to be perfect. Know that you're on the road to quality. But you can't launch with something that's broken. If it does break, we have to be able to fix it. But you can't, this is a really big play on words, but Dyson vacuums don't suck. They, they're good. They actually <laughs> suck, but they're good. The, the thing I was thinking about is, what is one of those products that rarely ever goes on sale? <coughs> Dyson vacuum. Why is that? This guy made like a thousand prototypes of this vacuum before he got to the place that he was selling them. And then once he did, it led to a spin-off and a spin-off and a spin-off and, spin and fans. I mean, he makes fans now. And air dryers for hands. But it took him a thousand tries to get to the point that he didn't have to discount his products. Same goes for Apple. But the JCPenney model and the ShopCo model of discount it all, all you want means that people will never buy your product at full price. So pricing strategy, have you guys gotten to that in your startup yet? No? Okay, that's where market validation is going to be helpful, but if I ask you how much you're willing to pay for an Apple, are you going to tell me the truth, or are you just going to give me a ballpark number? Ballpark. Ballpark. If you ask consumers directly, hey, how much would you pay for that? They're probably going to lie to you, because they really don't know. They don't know that they need it, or if they need it, they don't really know how much they value it. 
So asking a customer, how much would you pay for this, is the worst question in the world. So instead of asking them, ask them other questions where you can figure out how much do they value this? What is it worth to them? Look at the marketplace. Do you have competitors? What do they sell it at? How much is too much? For instance, is anybody, did anyone go to the TEDx Lincoln, uh, the youth event this last? No. There's a TEDx, which is um, inspirational uh, talks and videos, but we have an event coming up next month. There was also an event called Ignite Lincoln. Anyone go to Ignite Lincoln? All right, networking opportunities, people. Um, there's, Ignite Lincoln was $10 to get in. TEDx is 50 So we can market to this audience over here, but the chances are people who went to an event to hear inspirational talks for 10 bucks might not be willing to shell out $50. They don't understand the difference in the cost strategy. So again, startups, or even if you're not a startup, people think startups are just tech or software. Starting a business, photography for example, what are you gonna charge? Well, I'm gonna charge 20 bucks for a session. Really? <laughs> that doesn't even get you gas to and from the session. <laughs> and if your customers say, well I can't pay more than that because my cousin takes photos. Okay, he just validated that he thinks his cousin's a good photographer, not your prime target. So you need to find people that value what it is that you have so you can be like these guys and have a good product and don't have to, to mark it down. So who in here has a good or a bad customer service story for me? You don't have to share it. Just raise your hand if you have had bad customer service. Okay. We all have had bad customer service. The problem with bad customer service is it can disband all of your marketing in a matter of minutes. So as you're planning your business, don't just think about the marketing you're going to do. Think about what happened, what are all of the, the scenarios that could happen in my business and how am I going to train my employees or myself or my business partner to handle that? What's going to be my mantras? What's going to be my, I hate the word policy, but what are going to be the things that I am very passionate about so that I don't have customer service cost me all my hard work? For instance, if a customer gets irate at Starbucks, they go through a training program, where they teach them, here's the five things you should say. Okay, it seems trivial, it seems like, well, that's a no-brainer. But it's a lot harder than it sounds when someone's yelling at you that their coffee's wrong. Does anyone work at Starbucks in here? <laughs> yeah, food service, if you haven't worked in food service, that's another good one to get into. Um, but when someone's yelling at you, you don't know how you're gonna react till it actually happens. So when someone's software breaks, if you have a tech product, if someone's software breaks and they call in and they lost all their data, what happens? Do you refund their money? Do you talk them through it? Do you give them a free year even though they probably don't trust you anymore? If you're a restaurant or a bar and someone leaves your restaurant and they're intoxicated, they get in their car and they get in an accident and they sue you, what happens? Some of those things we think, we think the aspect of owning a business is so fun, we don't think through all of those things that are less than fun that once that happens, you're like, forget it, I'm just done. I can't handle this. Bad things will happen, so think about them now so that you don't have to deal with the, oh, I, I, I didn't expect that. This is an example of a good customer service. It had some bad PR just because of the way the person handled it, but this was a Red Robin receipt, and this gal definitely was expecting a baby. She must have been very expecting a baby because you don't want to do the, oh, you're pregnant and you're not. <laughs> That's never good to do that. But uh, this, this server gave her a mom-to-be discount. Didn't tell her, but just put it on the receipt when it came to the table. And the, the dad-to-be was so blown away, he posted it to Twitter. It made its rounds, made it to the front page of Reddit. It made it on a customer service blog. But this little little piece right here, eleven fifty dollars as a discount, was all it cost the restaurant. And it got them to the front page of Reddit. So we can't predict what's going to go viral, just like the Oreos thing in the, in the Super Bowl. But you can predict that your actions, if you go above and beyond, will come back for you in good ways. If you just do the bare minimum and just get by because you're just fed up with customers, you might need to be the person running the business and you need to have someone else be the face of your business. Because if you're not good right here, you're not going to be in business long. All right, who has read anything by Simon Sinek? Anybody? Yes, what did, what did he write? Start with, why. start with why. So Simon Sinek has a really good business philosophy that he says start with why. Because when you're at a networking event and someone says, what do you do? And you say, I'm launching a startup that sells kitties to young children that want a cat. Okay, well.